<clears throat> thank you, Joe, and thanks everybody for coming here today. Uh, I want to commend the report, which I had the privilege to read in advance. It is important every month, but especially during a presidential transition, that we have a well-informed, non-polemical debate about the policy choices that we face. And this report is a contribution not only to the realm of ideas, but to the quality of the discourse. So I thank you for pulling it together. As you mentioned, I've had a couple of interesting and very nerdy job titles. Uh, for the last five years, Assistant Secretary for International Security and Nonproliferation, and for the last couple months, Acting Under Secretary for Arms Control and International Security. And I hope you notice right away the emphasis on international security. The job that I've been asked to do, that I've had the privilege to do, is to think in every way how to make the United States more secure. And one of the benefits of doing this job is that successive presidents going back more than 60 years have seen arms control agreements and non-proliferation initiatives as not just beneficial, but essential to the security of the United States. Now, I cannot speak for the incoming administration for reasons I'm sure you appreciate. But let me outline 10 general challenges ahead in arms control and non-proliferation. You got 10 things, I got 10 things. Okay, we'll see. <laughs> All right. Now some of these, these are clearly at the forefront. They are on differing time scales, as we can discuss. First and most urgently, we must work with our allies and partners to address the North Korean nuclear and missile programs. We continue to call on all states to use every available channel, every available means of influence and leverage to make clear to North Korea that further provocations are unacceptable, and we will take steps to show there are consequences to the DPRK's unlawful conduct. At the same time, we must strengthen the deterrent and defensive capabilities of and cooperation between our allies, the Republic of Korea and Japan. Second, we must continue to work with partners around the world to ensure that Iran does not acquire a nuclear weapon. And that means the continued implementation of the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. It is working, and with perseverance, it will continue to work. As President Obama said on Monday, unraveling a deal that is preventing Iran from pursuing a nuclear weapon would be hard to explain particularly if the alternative is to free Iran from any obligations and go ahead and pursue a weapon. And a solitary U.S. effort without the support of our longstanding partners who made this deal possible could never, in my opinion, result in a better deal. Third, the international community must continue international security, nuclear security and nonproliferation efforts. We've made great progress over the last 15 years, but these efforts are never finished. Every nation should work within its own authority and multilaterally to prevent the further spread of nuclear weapons and materials, including to terrorists, and to constrain the co regional competition in nuclear arms. <clears throat> Four. Requirements for verification have been and continue to be become still more demanding as the number of parties possessing nuclear weapons increases and the number of weapons and the size of the accountable objects decrease. Effective verification is, as you know, <clears throat> a key feature of any successful arms agreement and is usually the hardest part of an arms agree control agreement to negotiate. So the United States initiated, in, in coordination with the NGO Nuclear Threat Initiative, the International Partnership for Nuclear Disarmament Verification. And we're making progress with more than 25 countries that are participating, and we hope 
<clears throat> to involve also additional NGOs and universities. Fifth, the U.S. has to continue strategic dialogues with other states that possess nuclear weapons. These dialogues, and in particular the P5 process, enhance transparency and mutual understanding. That leads to more predictability and, most importantly, more stability. Gradually, we are laying the groundwork for still more sizable reductions in the nuclear arsenals of the world. Six, the United States must continue to review its own nuclear posture and examine again the fundamental role of our nuclear deterrent. I would also hope to see in this country and in other countries a continued acknowledgement that deterrence and disarmament share the same goal, to ensure that nuclear weapons are never used again. The Obama administration has made it a priority to maintain a nuclear sustainment and modernization program that ensures a safe, secure, and effective nuclear deterrent. We've reduced the number and types of nuclear weapons. We have a policy that helps assure our non-nuclear allies that they don't need their own nuclear deterrent capabilities, and one that preserves and, we hope, enhances strategic stability with Russia and China. Now, of course, the modernization program put forward under this administration is costly. And there are budget constraints and every possibility of still increasing budget deficits despite the downward trend in budget deficits in, during this administration. There are tough choices ahead that have to do both with stability and with budget. Seventh, it's clear that the lion's share of the disarmament work ahead lies with the United States and Russia. We two nations hold 90% of the world's nuclear weapons. The U.S. has long sought a robust, constructive relationship with Russia in all fields, and especially as a partner in nuclear disarmament. Unfortunately, the Russian leadership has become more selective in honoring the rules and institutions that Russia signed on to before and during and since the Cold War, rules and institutions which benefited Russia. Washington and Moscow have kept talking about arms control through a long series of crises over the last 50 years. But it's important to recognize that the Russian actions in Ukraine are not like an espionage scandal or a collision at sea. They are, as nearly all European states agree, a rejection of fundamental rules of European and global order and of the bedrock principles of European and global security. We still are making progress. Both of us are faithfully implementing the New START tr Treaty. We are cooperating and implementing the JCPOA with Iran. Despite the difficulties and, in fact, because of them, the U.S. must remain ready and willing to engage in meaningful arms control discussions with the Russian Federation. Eight, there are long-standing matters in the multilateral world to address, like the negotiation of a treaty banning the production of fissile material, and the entry into force of the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. In my view, no single action would do more to firmly establish U.S. leadership in the nuclear field than the ratification of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. Nine, we need to innovate and think about these issues in new, bold ways but we also must be pragmatic. With regard to the current efforts to pursue the negotiation of a nuclear weapons ban treaty, I've said it before, this administration respects the sincerity and the passion of those who voted to move forward with this effort, our partners around the world, and of the NGOs that have mobilized this movement. We simply don't agree 
that it is the right or the practical way to achieve disarmament at this point in history. Achieving the peace and the security of a nuclear free world, the central goal that President Obama enunciated in Prague in 2009, is an enormous, multifaceted undertaking. It's not something that will be finished in a giant public conference with a concluding declaration. And that's exactly why the next administration has a duty to keep working on all of the issues that I've been discussing. And that's a duty that this administration, and in my view, the next administration, must pursue regardless of what happens with the nuclear weapons ban discussions. Tenth, we have to be ready to seize the unexpected opportunity. I had the honor to be in Reykjavik last month at the 30th anniversary of the Gorbachev-Reagan meetings. And that was exactly the kind of unpredictable opportunity that two leaders seized. And although they left Reykjavik with the headlines being failure at a summit, within two years we had signed two of the most important arms control agreements ever made. So how do you stay ready to seize those opportunities as unpredictable as they are? Well, we have to do the following. First, to maintain technical cooperation with Russia and other partners, not only on New START, but on other non-proliferation opportunities. Second, we have to be able to discuss and address all the factors that make up security <clears throat> and strategic stability without making such tight linkages among them that it becomes impossible to move forward on any single one of them. Third, we have to maintain a core of negotiators who have real world experience, who have advanced listening skills, and who have the capability to speak with respect to people with whom they don't agree. And finally, we have to pursue open communication with all the relevant partners, government, civil society, academia, the technical sector, and of course, NGOs and foundations like this one. The United States should always be open to inclusive and pragmatic dialogue. I have a captive audience. Nobody is sleeping yet, so I'm going to stray from <laughs> the nuclear field for just a moment because there's other crucial prior priorities in disarmament and non-proliferation. First, it's essential that the international community respond to a very disturbing development, and that is the first thoroughly documented use of chemicals as a weapon by a state that has signed the Chemical Weapons Convention, and that is, of course, the OPCW UN Joint Investigative Mechanism report that found both the Syrian government and El Daesh uh, responsible for the use of chemical weapons in Syria. Uh, if we want to deter future violations, not only of this convention, but of all arms control agreements, then accountability matters. Advances in the life science and the increasingly widespread availability of materials and knowledge have placed biological weapons within the reach of more actors than ever before. We must have a concerted, sustained effort to support and fund and use the tools that we have at our disposal to combat the threat of biological weapons as well. Now, there are another one or two hundred issues in this field that the next president and his team have to address. But in the very short term, my duty and that of the incredibly talented team that I'm fortunate to lead in the State Department is to follow President Obama's lead and to complete a smooth transition to a new team. Demonstrating domestic stability <clears throat> is a vital component of maintaining international stability. And our ability to make new agreements with allies or with adversaries depends crucially upon our credibility and consistency 
in honoring existing agreements. So let me just conclude by saying that we, as a government, as a society, have to stay open to the discussion of new ideas, like those laid out in this report. And we need the American public to join the discussion. And so I welcome every effort like this one to enable the American public to discuss these issues in an educated, rational, non-emotional, non-polemical way. So thank you. And if Joe says so, we have time for questions. We, we do. Thank you very much, Tom. Thanks for joining us. Rational, oh, got it, non-polemical, got it, non-emotional? Not quite there with you on that you one. <laughs> Let's start off, and, and um, the undersecretary, undersecretary can recognize his sure. own um, uh, questioners, but please identify yourself and uh, wait for the microphone. And let me help you with, while, you, while you're waiting for that microphone. No, 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 no. We have a whole world out there watching this on the Plowshares Facebook page. Uh, 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 Mr. Secretary, <laughs> how about number uh, you, you 11? Please then, uh, can oh, you my identify name is uh, Larry Korb. I'm a, a senior fellow at the Center for American Progress. Mr. Secretary, how about number 11, no first use policy? It needs to be discussed. I have no announcement for you today. <laughs> please, identify yourself. And we have a couple people with microphones. They're working as fast as they can to get them to you. And then we'll go to Barbara behind you. Uh, thank you very much. I'm Gail Tarleton from Washington State. I am curious about uh, how some of the allies in the Iran deal or in, uh, in the nonproliferation arena have talked to you about what comes next. Other, from other countries. Yeah. Uh, they've asked me a lot of questions I can't answer. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> uh, there is a concern that you would see if you've lived through a presidential transition before, uh, which is uh, diplomats and specialists from every world from every country in the world, a big part of their job <clears throat> is analyzing, learning, and accommodating themselves to the direction the United States is going. And the prospect of a change in direction, even if it is a speculative change, unnerves diplomats who like nice, tidy, orderly lives. Uh, and so it's understandable that there are a lot of hard questions. I think apprehension is premature. I think the, uh, again, as the president has set the tone, uh, there are professionals throughout the United States government without whom the next administration cannot succeed, no matter which direction it wants to go. And because they are professionals, and because we expect professional people to be appointed to top positions, uh, I think that there's no reason to be concerned at this point. There is a reason to speak out on policies that concern you uh, before or after a transition. That's your job as citizens. Uh, but I think it is uh, uh, a little bit presumptuous to assume what the policies will be once you know the names of the people who will be executing them. Okay. Thanks, Barbara Slavin from the Atlantic Council. Um, I was at an event yesterday where a, a, a General Bushinsky, who I believe has a long experience on the Russian side in arms control agreements, said there'd be no way Russia would agree to further reductions in strategic uh, systems unless missile defense was also on the table. Could you imagine that now that we have the Iran nuclear deal and there is no threat of Iranian nuclear missiles hitting Europe, 
uh, that there would be a reduction, could be a reduction in missile defense in return for more uh, curbs on strategic arms? Thanks. Hmm. That's a good one. First, I meant to say hello to Washington State, which is also my hometown, and I'm uh, glad to see Congressman Smith contributing to this since he was my representative until the redistricting goblins moved my hometown. Uh, the, uh, on missile defense, there's a, a very thoughtful paper uh, in this publication that I commend to you by Dr. Arasta. Um, and it makes a, a uh, rational, credible argument for doing what you suggest. Um, it is important for any administration to recognize that the basis of establishing stability uh, is not establishing mirror images. It's not tit-for-tat production, and it's not tit-for-tat reduction. It's rather having a very clear vision of what we believe needs to be constrained in this case on the Russian side. And it also means being able to understand and engage with what the Russians say is the primary thing they believe needs to be constrained. Um, and I think the only thing I would add to that is Statements of never, I realize I used one, but statements about never <laughs> are generally not helpful. Uh, statements that say we can never do A unless you do B, and a response that says, well, we can never do B, so forget about that, uh, do not form a basis for a meaningful dialogue. Now. How much further you can go will be up to the next administration. I'm right here. I, I can stay till 3 o'clock. Uh, Jan Lodel, Atlanta Council. Thank you for a terrific speech. That was great. Um, so picking up on your comment about diplomats getting antsy uh, quickly, uh, about the way things are put and so forth. So the president-elect has said that maybe places like South Korea and Japan and Saudi Arabia, Arabia are, are sort of freeloaders and maybe they should have their own nuclear weapons and so forth. So extended deterrence seems to be in some ways the most fragile and most fraught part of U.S. policy. It played a big role in the nuclear policy review and so forth, nu nuclear posture review. So what, how, what do you think has to be done to reassure particularly those powers, particularly South Korea, which now faces a workable nuclear threat on their own border. I mean, do we have to, are, are, is it crazy to think that maybe we have to redeploy some tactical nuclear weapons there? Do we have to build up our own forces? Uh, or are there gonna, is there gonna be a way to get through this? Well, first, there's always a difference between a presidential candidate and a president. And the president-elect has uh, not pronounced himself on nuclear issues yet. Uh, speaking for this administration, extended deterrence is essential for a number of reasons. First, as I mentioned in my remarks, it has prevented a number of our al allies who are no less technologically advanced than we are from concluding that they needed to invest in a nuclear weapons program. And in that sense, as foreseen in the negotiation of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, it has served the purposes of that treaty in, present, in preventing horizontal proliferation. Uh, secondly, and 
without expanding on this thought, I'll just say there is no solution for the crisis posed by North Korea without extended deterrence as a crucial element of that solution. Uh, there is a lot that the new administration can and should do, and I expect will do, to reassure allies that the credibility of the U.S. commitment, which is not just nuclear, the credibility of the U.S. commitment is something that extends across administrations and indeed across generations. That's what our friends and our allies expect of the United States, and that's what I expect of the next administration as well. Thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it. Thanks, Thanks,